So, good morning, welcome to this class on your sense of human movement. Uh, this is part 1 of our discussion on uh, membrane physiology. We start our discussion about uh, the physiology of the biological membrane. So, this forms the foundation of uh, this course on your sense of human movement. So, in today's class we will be talking about uh, physiology of cell membrane and what is the composition of uh, fluid within the cell membrane and outside the cell membrane. So, this is expected not to be the same. So, that means that there is different gradients. So, there may be concentration gradient, there may be other gradients. So, we will discuss that and uh, also transport across cell membrane. So, there is going to be diffusion, active transport and osmosis are some of the examples of uh, transport. Also, uh, there are other forms of transport such, uh, such as uh, facilitated diffusion such as uh, co-transport, counter-transport etcetera. So, excitable cells are uh, subclass of uh, cells and they maintain a steady potential difference across their cell membrane. Typical concentrations of uh, different substances in excitable cells for example, are uh, given in this table. So, there is extracellular fluid ECF means extracellular fluid and ICF means intracellular fluid. Right. So, there is fluid everywhere in the body the body is composed of about 50 to 70 percent water. It uh, changes between individuals, between groups of individuals. So, people who have a higher fat content for example, have a lower amount of water and vice versa. How, where is this fluid present? Of this about two thirds of the fluid is present in the intracellular or matrix are within the cell and about one third of the fluid is present in the extracellular matrix. right? So, the fluid that is contained within the cell is called intracellular fluid and the fluid that is present outside the cell is called extracellular fluid. And typical concentrations in milli equivalent per liter of different uh, substances are uh, given here for some substances it has been given here. So, for uh, sodium 140 milli equivalent per liter is present uh, outside the cell and 14 is present inside the cell. So, that means there is a gradient and what is the direction of this gradient? So, suppose there was an opening that allows transport of sodium across the membrane, it is going to be transported in that direction. Please note where the arrow mark is. So, potassium is present in very small quantities outside the cell and relatively large quantity inside the cell. So, once again there is a gradient and suppose there is a channel that allows transport of uh, potassium, it is going to be transported in that direction unless there is going to be expense of energy. So, note the arrow mark in this case. Likewise, for calcium the gradient is in that direction, for chloride the gradient is in that direction, gradient is in that direction and for uh, this the gradient is in that direction. So, not. so, different substances may be transported in different directions depending on the concentration gradient of for those substances. How is, how is this transport happening? will form the discussion for the first few lectures. Right. So, there is the cell membrane. The cell membrane is composed of both hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances. This is basically a lipid bilayer, a lipid bilayer that is composed of both hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances and it also has what are called as membrane proteins that are generally classified into multiple types. Integral proteins are transmembrane proteins are those that span the entire uh, membrane and then there are peripheral proteins that are attached to one side of the membrane. Right. Turns out that the plasma membrane or the cell membrane is a crucial innovation of uh, evolution. Suppose there was no 
plasma membrane. What would happen is that there it would be no such entity called as a cell. There would be no difference between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. I compare this usually using the example of a room that has no door. Suppose there was only walls and a roof and a floor and there was no window or no door, that room would have practically no application or no utility, right. Or suppose if there was a, if, if it was a completely open space, other than playing sports, that space has very little utility, for example. So, in, or in other words, the crucial aspect that is desirable for the plasma membrane is that we want the transport to happen at specific points in space and or specific points along the membrane and at specific points in time or what we desire is uh, some form of selective permeability. And this is the most crucial feature of the plasma membrane, selective permeability. If there was no selective permeability, if all ions can be transported in all directions, then there would exist no gradient. So, there would be no difference between the inside of the cell and outside of the cell. So, function of the cell itself would be would be affected in a great manner, right. So, function or healthy function is primarily due to selective permeability of the plasma membrane. So, important functions of the plasma membrane is basically integrity of the contents of the cell. Uh, other than other than structural integrity also the contents of the cell contents of the cell also structural support okay. these are important functions of the cell membrane more importantly it also enables or facilitates transport of specific substances in specific directions right so, in general a concentration gradient is present, substances are present in different concentrations inside the cell and outside the cell. So, in many cases it is desirable to maintain this concentration gradient and these substances may be, what are these substances? These may be, these are solutes, these solutes may be charged or they may be electrolytes. or they may not be charged, they may be not a non electrolytes. Suppose the substance is charged, then it has important consequences because if a positive charge say for example, this is the intracellular fluid. So, that on top is the inside of the cell, in the bottom is the outside of the cell. Suppose there is a positive ion outside the cell and it is moving inside, suppose it is getting transported inside. That means, one positive charge has moved from outside to inside effectively making the inside of the cell a bit more positive with respect to the outside, slightly more positive with respect to the outside. In other words, it has created a slight amount of charge separation. If this happens in relatively large amount, you would expect what is uh, called as potential gradient to develop. So, also note that transport of uh, the charged and non-charged particles differ in one other fundamental manner. The non-charged particles are not affected by any potential gradient that may be previously present between the inside and outside the cell. Suppose there is a potential gradient between the inside and outside, suppose there is some gradient or somebody is uh, you know stimulating something of that sort, there is an electrode there, there is an electrode, suppose something of that sort is uh, existent. In that case, the non-charged particles or the non-electrolytes 
will not be affected by the potential gradient, but the charged particles will be affected or in other words, if the inside of the cell is having a higher potential when compared with the outside, then it is difficult for a cation for a positive charge to move inside from outside because the inside is already at a higher potential. For example, this is true, this is this is just an example. So, depending on the presence or absence of a potential gradient, transport of electrolytes or charged substances will vary, will uh, be affected and also the, the charged substances movement itself will create a potential gradient. So, there are two important consequences for uh, the transport of uh, charged or electrolytes, charged particles or electrolytes. This is uh, not true with the non-charged particles, but mostly in this course we will be talking about uh, transport of sodium, potassium, ions or uh, electrolytes. Right? So, and there are different forms of uh, transport. Suppose there is a concentration gradient, then if there is a channel available for transport, then usually there is going to be diffusion of this substance from the region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. This is usually a passive process, no carrier is required. Usually oxygen, carbon dioxide uh, and other such substances can easily be transported across the membrane. There is a relatively high permeability of the membrane for these substances, no specific carrier is required for this transport. Then there are cases called uh, carrier mediated transport or facilitated diffusion. In such cases, there is a need for a carrier or a membrane protein. The example is the case of uh, glucose transport in skeletal muscle. Right. So, this is also a passive process. Then there are processes in which there is a need for substances to be taken against the concentration gradient. In general, this requires expense of energy. Right. So, suppose you are climbing uh, to the first floor or suppose you are climbing to the second floor. As you are climbing up the stairs, you are expending energy. Right? However, it is easier for us to drop a ball from the second floor balcony to the floor because there is a gradient, there is an existing gradient, no energy expense is required for that process. Right? So, in general, transportation against the gradient requires expense of energy. Right? The classic example is the example of sodium potassium pump which we will see in greater detail later. And then there are other forms of transport such as co-transport, co counter transport that are called as uh, secondary transport mechanisms. Right? So, in this course we are interested mainly in these two topics, right? those that are in bold and we are less interested in the other topics that are in grey. So, if you take the case of uh, diffusion for example, right, suppose a substance is present in large concentration outside the cell membrane like this. So, you can see that uh, the concentration of this solute is much higher outside the cell membrane and assuming that this cell membrane is permeable to this solute, right. So, it is selectively permeable to this solute, let us assume that. Then with sufficient time you could expect that the concentration inside the cell and outside the cell is approximately the same with sufficient amount of uh, time. So, as time passes after some time there is going to be uh, an equal concentration of uh, this substance inside the cell and outside the cell and the net movement of particles from inside and outside is going to be approximately 0. right? Once again importantly, it is crucial whether this solute is an electrolyte or whether it is a non-charged particle because if it is an electrolyte, then movement of this substance from outside to the inside will create a charge separation or a potential gradient and that could affect movement of other ions in future. So, that is 
something that we would like to discuss in future classes. Right. So, an example of uh, primary active transport is the case of uh, sodium potassium ATPase that is present in uh, cell membranes. In general, this involves active transport in general involves an expense of energy as we discussed uh, some time ago and the transport is usually uphill. So, involves transport against a gradient. So, you have to go uphill. So, that means you have to spend energy. The classic example is the sodium potassium ATPase that we will see in the future slides. Right. So, let us remember before we move on let us remember the composition of uh, or the concentration of uh, substances within and uh, outside the cell. Sodium is present in great quantity outside the cell. So, the gradient is in that direction and uh, potassium is present in great quantity inside the cell and the gradient is in the opposite direction. right? So, if the channel is available for transport and if it is open then what you would expect is the natural movement of sodium would be from outside the cell to inside the cell in that direction and the natural movement of potassium would be from inside the cell to outside the cell. This is what you would expect, but in some cases there is a need for transport to happen in the opposite direction. I am using a different color just to show that the transport direction is against the gradient. This color means against the gradient is it not. So, there are cases when this is of interest and for this obviously, energy must be expended. How is this achieved? That is the question that is what we will see in the next few slides. Right. This is achieved by a membrane protein or transmembrane protein called as sodium potassium pump or the sodium potassium ATPase right. The sodium potassium pump. So, we use the word pump because uh, so, the classic case of the water pump for example, transports uh, water from a sump which is at a lower gradient which is at a lower height to a overhead tank that is of interest for us. So, we want to keep the water stored in the overhead tank so that when we open the tap water will flow right. But for this energy is expended we have a motorized pump that takes the water from the sump or from some source may be from a bore well and uh, pumps it up to the overhead tank. Suppose, uh, this water is we are not able to pump then there will be no water in the tap right. So, that is obvious. So, pump means pushing the water upward or transporting the substance against a gradient or involving uh, uphill transport and generally involving expense of energy. So, in the case of sodium potassium ATPase, this is a transmembrane protein that uh, takes up energy and undergoes conformational change. So, this this substance this this membrane protein has two conformational states an E 1 state in which the binding sites are uh, open on the inside of the cell like this. So, the this is the opening. So, the pump or the binding site is open on the inside of the cell and has very high affinity for sodium in this state. So, then what happens and let us remember sodium is high outside. So, the and sodium is low inside and potassium potassium is low outside and potassium is high inside right but this uh, this pump has high affinity for sodium 
in this E1 conformational state. So, sodium from inside where already the concentration of sodium is low goes and attaches. So, there are 3 sodium ions that attach to the 3 binding sites of this uh, membrane protein and ATP molecule attaches to its binding site. When ATP molecule attaches to its binding site the high energy high energy third phosphate bond is broken and it is converted into ADP plus phosphate. So, ADP leaves the leaves the system and this uh, energy released due to the breakage of this bond makes this uh, pump makes this ATPase to undergo a conformational change. So, earlier note it was open earlier this was open on the inside. So, that is the opening, but once ATP attaches and uh, the phosphate bond is broken and energy is released, it is open on the outside. Once again, this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside. So, here you see that the pump is open on the outside, right, and in this state, this is called as the E2 state. In this state, this enzyme or has a high affinity for potassium. So, what happens is that when it is open in this state it has relatively low affinity for sodium. So, what happens is that sodium escapes the system from here and potassium that was present that was earlier present in relatively low quantity let us remember K plus is low outside and Na plus is high outside right potassium that is already present in less quantity outside gets attached to these points why because of the high affinity of uh, this pump in the E2 state. So, potassium gets attached to these two binding sites and the pump undergoes one more conformational change and opens up on the inside releasing potassium here. Once again you know so that means from a region of low potassium concentration to a region of relatively high potassium concentration transport has happened. So, and the and the phosphate also leaves the system. So, with the expense of one ATP molecule the number of conformational changes that is undergone by this uh, enzyme are 2. So, that is basically between E 1 to E 2 and once again from E 2 to E 1. The cost for both this conformational changes. So, that is the first change and this is the second change. The cost is for both included the cost is 1 ATP molecule. At the expense of 1 ATP molecule this, this enzyme undergoes 2 conformational changes thus transporting substances transporting sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient right. So, also note early on there was uh, 3 sodium that gets transported from this side to that side and it is that is 3 and it is actually 2 potassiums that are transported in that direction. Effectively each cycle of this pump creates one less sodium or makes the inside of the cell a little less positive or a little more negative. So, this is an electrogenic process. So, one more time. So, since there are 3 sodium ions that are transported from inside to outside and 2 potassium ions that are transported from outside to inside effectively one positive charge has left the cell because of this reason the cell becomes a little less positive or a little more negative with each cycle of uh, this ATPS function right. So, this is an electrogenic process or it creates charge separation right. So, for his discovery of uh, this important function. So, this paper was published in 1957. Uh, Dr. Jens Christian Schoo was awarded Nobel Prize in uh, chemistry in 
1997. So, an important discovery very impactful. So, Dr. James Christian School was a Danish physician who contributed to this field of uh, research in a great manner. So, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1997. Right. So, in summary what we have seen in today's class is uh, that transport involves uh, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion or in general these two can be called together as passive processes and then it can be active processes of which uh, there are two types there is primary active transport and there is secondary active transport and then there are two types of this uh, secondary active transport. And we have seen that uh, one example of uh, primary active transport is uh, sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATPase. What is happening is that uh, three sodium ions go from inside of the cell to outside of the cell against the gradient and two potassium ions go from outside the cell to inside the cell one once again against the gradient and this causes a charge separation effectively it makes the cell a little less positive and uh, the cost of this is uh, 1 ATP molecule. So, with this uh, we come to the end of this lecture we will continue this conversation in the next class thank you very much.